I think it's about that time. So um, let me uh, welcome you all back to the uh, closing session of our uh, fall 2010 meeting. Um, I hope you'll agree with me. It's been an intense but interesting uh, day and a half, and uh, we still have uh, something very special in store. Um, before we go there, though, I do want to just take care of a few housekeeping reminders and uh, other things. Uh, first off, um, I want to just take a moment. I do believe Herbert is still here. Herbert von de Sample, yes. Um, I want to recognize Herbert and um, his colleague, Mike Nelson, from uh, Old Dominion. Um, they just, uh, a few days ago, won a very hotly contested Digital Preservation Award for the year for their work on the Memento system. I know that uh, Herbert and uh, Michael and colleagues um, uh, showed some of that work in an early stage to us here um, at a prior CNI meeting, and I've been promised uh, that we'll be seeing an update on it, but um, it's really, I think, quite an achievement and quite an important milestone to see that work recognized there. So um, join me in uh, congratulating Herbert and Michael. And with that, let me, um, uh, let me just remind you of a few upcoming dates. In your uh, packet, you've got the dates for the spring CNI meeting. Uh, that will be in San Diego. Um, I know that when we've talked about where should we have the not in Washington meeting, um, a few of you have said over the years, San Diego would be a really good place. And actually, it's worked out that I think in early 2011, San Diego is going to be a really good place. So I hope to see many of you there. And then you also have the December dates when we'll be back here. I want to give you one other set of December dates that aren't in the packet um, and that just got settled a few days ago. Those are for the International Digital Curation Conference, which, as you know, CNI has been uh, co-sponsoring. Uh, this is the conference that the UK Digital Curation Center puts together every year. And that's going to be held in Bristol um, on December 7 through 9, 2011, the week before for uh, the uh, CNI fall meeting, for those of you who are tracking on that. Um, I'd also like to say a few rounds of thank yous. Um, I'd, I'd like to start by saying a thank you to our presenters. Um, getting around the country and the world isn't as easy as it used to be. The weather seems to be getting weirder every year. Um, maybe it's just me, but you know, travel seems to get complicated. Um, and uh, we had some particularly tricky weather this time, yet uh, we managed to have all of our sessions, all our presenters made it, um, and uh, they've made this a fabulous conference, I think. Um, I know that I've seen some wonderful sessions. I know many of you have told me how valuable you've found um, some of the sessions you've heard. So I'd like to call for a really big hand for all of our presenters. And I'd also like to just say thanks to the CNI team that makes these meetings run smoothly um, to uh, everyone who helped with the uh, registration, made the AV happen, got the sessions together. Um, uh, it's um, an enormous amount of work, and um, please join me in thanking them as well. And with that, um, let me get on to the main matter at hand. Uh, I want to introduce 
Dan Cohen. I think many of you know him. Uh, many more of you I know know of his work um, in many different areas, in digital history, his leadership along with um, the late Roy Rosenswig of the um, Center for History and New Media at um, uh, George Mason University, his scholarship on the intellectual history of mathematics in the Victorian age, um, his work with um, sophisticated use of uh, textual databases to inform that scholarship. Uh, I could go on, uh, you know, for a long time about Dan. He's got a uh, amazing range of interests and insights and um, uh, you know on a very personal note he has been uh, a huge help to the coalition and to me personally over the last few years through his service as an at-large member of the coalition steering committee where he has been just um, uh, fabulous in terms of keeping us connected with the evolving scholarship um, uh, around e-research and how it ramifies through scholarly practice and scholarly communications. Um, I'm going, to, I'm not going to try and summarize his talk because he's here to give you that talk. Um, uh, so let me just turn it over to Dan. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome. Um, thanks, Cliff, for raising expectations sky high um, there. Um, no, I do, I do really want to thank Cliff um, and Joan and everyone in, in involved in CNI um, really for their hospitality and for inviting me into, you know, the CNI crowd. I, I, you know, I feel as a traditionally trained historian really lucky to have fallen into this crowd um, that really works on all parts of the infrastructure that supports my work and in the future, uh, I believe, all the work that scholars will do. Um, and so um, I really want to thank everyone here, and uh, I appreciate the audience. Um, I also think that these, the, the, the people in this audience really get the web. And so in, in some way, this talk is, is perhaps not to you, although in part it, it perhaps is. But, but the title of the talk and, and of the book um, I'm writing is comes from the sense that um, you know, even 20 years after its inception, I think a lot of my colleagues really don't understand the potential of the web. I mean, it's pretty remarkable to think, but if you, you know, were just to go to the American Historical Association meeting and just walk around in the halls, and indeed there have been many surveys recently that the AHA has done about the use of new media, it's remarkably um, marginalized. And um, I just don't think there's a lot of of my colleagues broadly in history or the humanities who see the potential. Um, they see the web as really a place for electronic copies of what they produce, rather than a, a kind of locus of creativity and of new ways of thinking. Um, they don't really see the web as a place where uh, their scholarship might be helped or their scholarly community might be realized. And so, um, I just wanted to pause and, and at this time in my career and, and just get some thoughts down on paper and um, in talks like this about you know, what I sort of see is, is necessary for the next 20 years. And in a sense, also to reawakening all of our interest in the web and how really a, an unusual, weird place it is still 20 years after its inception. Um, I think that's a very important thing to do is to really continue to understand what an unusual network it is and, and what it can do um, for us. Um, you know, when I start my graduate course in digital history, um, I like to throw students off balance, not by looking at academic work on the web, but by venturing out um, onto what I like to call the vernacular web, or just the web that's out there. And so I just pick a topic at random and then go to some sites that are out there on the web. Again, avoiding academia. So I'm going to do that right now. So if you want to just throw out some potential topics, web topics that we could look at. Burritos. Burritos. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's, let's talk about burritos for just a second. Um, 
you know, so this is something I would do in class, is let's just look at burrito websites, right? Not history websites, but let's look at sites about burritos. So I want to start here today with um, this random website that I've pulled up on burritos. Um, it's called the Burrito Bracket. It's a very un-ivory tower website, as you can tell from the web design. Um, you know, this is a very typical site of the open web. Uh, it couldn't exist in a book format or an article format. It's live, it's interactive, it's got a map. Um, tell you a bit more about this, the creator of the site went to uh, all the cheap uh, Mexican restaurants in Chicago's Wicker Park uh, neighborhood and um, with scientific precision um, analyzed uh, carne asada burritos at each site um, in a sort of playoff fashion. Um, you can see here it's got a geolocated mashup of data, burrito data um, overlaid on uh, Google Maps. It has a relatively sophisticated grading system that I've thought uh, to adopt in academia with um, not one, not two, but three different meat categories, which can be from one to five jalapeno peppers. Um, it's got a rather, rather clever hack, actually, of Google Spreadsheets to create the uh, bracket playoffs for the burrito joints. <laughs> and it has an extensive documentary archive for supplementary evidence on the burritos um, at, hosted at Flickr. Um, you know, not too shabby, right? For this random website about burritos that uh, shows up here. Thank you, person I never spoke to in the audience beforehand. <laughs> So I think, you know, most of all, what this kind of site shows me out there on the vernacular web, it's someone trying to really get the web. It, it, it's someone living in the web, trying to respond to it, um, trying to understand its potential, its interactivity. Um, amazingly, at, at its prime, this site garnered an audience in the tens of thousands. Um, it, it, this is the vernacular web. And, I just love how web savvy it is. It sort of cobbles together off the rack tools, blogging software, mapping tools um, that don't require fancy training in GIS. It uses Google Docs. It's got a polling, a polling plugin widget um, down there in the lower right uh, asking its audience whether a burrito is a sandwich. Um, and it's got a makeshift photo archive um, and a good old fashioned research methodology. Uh, it also, I think very importantly, it creates a community. A community arose around this site, the burrito bracket, um, because of its interactivity, because of the way it operated in a very webby way. And it iterated toward complexity from a very basic, you know, off the rack blogger uh, installation. Now, there's something more unusual about this website, which I'm going to leave as a puzzle and a challenge to the audience and to the Twitter back channel. I'll come back at the end of this talk to give you the answer. For now, again, let's just use this as a typical website. So the web way and the academic way, you know, I think the academic way is very different in, different in attitude. And really, I think this talk is, it's a talk about psychology and attitude more than anything. Um, you know, in the academy, we tend to be deliberative, sometimes to a fault. Um, you know, I think most scholars do not believe, as Voltaire did, that the perfect is the enemy of the good enough. Um, we like to get everything in ship shape. We don't like to expose our work, our process, as the owner of the burrito bracket did. Um, we are loath to experiment in genre. We sort of have the genres we know about. Um, we don't want to cobble together any tools. Um, we don't want to iterate in any way. Um, we want to stick with the modes that we know, the modes of pedagogy, the modes of research, the modes of scholarly communication, which has served us well. I think that's somewhat understandable. Um, however, I think it's also rather conservative. And I think, you know, when you see scholars looking at the web, if, they, if their work has to go on the web, they want it I, in an identical format to the way it exists offline or close to identical. If there have to be comments on their work on the web, this open web, they want them vetted or gated or um, somehow uh, moderated. Um, and so what we've often ended up with is a, a sort of contemporary instances of the photo play, um, right? The classic study of um, 
when film was invented, and many of the early genres were photo plays where a camera was fixed, like this one that's filming me right now, at a stage where a play took place. Because, well, what's the genre that everyone knew? They knew the play, and so you just have a fixed camera, and you, you videotape or film the play, and then you can distribute that. You use it as a distribution mechanism. And it wasn't until directors started experimenting with genre, experimenting with cutting, multiple cameras, asynchronous filming, all those elements that um, really we have film as we have it today. And I, I think we're kind of at that point where there's still a lot of, at least my colleagues, perhaps not the people in this room, who are still kind of going through that exercise, if they do anything online, of doing a kind of modern photo play. So the question I want to ask is, what if we take the burrito bracket seriously? Um, what can it tell us about the successful genres of the web? and how we might emulate them to further our academic ends. You know, the web is 20 years old. It's about to graduate from college, I guess, in web years. Um, but it's, it's still far from mature. And I think it's really worth, again, reawakening our sense of, of wonder about the web and how strange it is and how different it is from academia and how it's still full of surprises. Um, I try to spend part of every day just looking at the vernacular web, vernacular web and what goes on there, new genres, um, unexpected kinds of websites to really understand what can be done. Um, it is indeed full of the unexpected. I want to show some examples today and how it's kind of influenced our work at the Center for History and New Media, um, and then sort of think ahead about what genres are emerging that we might be able to adopt. Here's a, good, a really good example, um, Layer Tennis, um, layertennis.com. Um, a very new kind of genre, um, and th what this is, is a website um, that takes uh, two designers every week on Friday and has them um, have a kind of debate or battle using graphical uh, art. So um, in this case, it's a match between Tom, um, Scott Thomas, who you might know uh, most famously was the uh, design director for Barack Obama's 2008 campaign. He's the one that came up with that O with the field um, in it. And, um, you know, one of the strongest visual identities of the last decade. Um, and on the other side, uh, designer illustrator Mark Weaver, um, also a very well-known um, designer. They're both actually rather intellectual. And what I find interesting about layer tennis here is what's going to happen in one day is they're going to have a kind of debate through art. They have to give each other their Photoshop files as they go back and forth in what's called the volley. So one person throws up a work of art, the other person gets the files that were used, the various layers in Photoshop parlance, um, and gets to edit those and maybe add their own layers in and put something new up that critiques the prior um, illustrator. So here we go, I'll go relatively quickly through this. So here's the first volley by Thomas. Um, he's got a quote from Seneca, ideas should be worth sharing. There is no delight in owning anything unshared. Here's Weaver, a bit more abstract. Thomas again. He's got a quote from Hume. Um, the wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. There is nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact from Arthur Conan Doyle. You can see here how they're playing which, with the form here. Uh, I mean, it's really stunning graphical work considering this is all done in one day. Um, art is anything you can get away with from McLuhan, of course. Reframed. But then again, art for art's sake is the philosophy of the well-fed from Frank Lloyd Wright. Another right quote, less is only more when, when more is no good. Beauty is no quality in things themselves. It exists merely in the mind which contemplates them. David Hume. And finally, half of art is knowing when to stop. <laughs> um, really great match, Weaver, with a, a tremendous final volley. He won, and actually he made it to the semifinals. Um, if you're interested in this genre, the finals are this Friday, um, uh, all day on, um, on LayerTennis.com. Um, so, I mean, this is just a completely unexpected genre. You wouldn't think that in one day you could have this 
good of a kind of intellectual debate, a graphical debate. Um, I think this is this qualifies as art. Um, it's um, uh, it's got a lot of really interesting elements to it, including a sustainability model, which is that it's sponsored by Adobe, which of course makes Creative Suites, uh, the Creative Suite. Um, so creative indeed. So I think this it's worth being an anthropologist here with the web and saying. You know, what, what can we find there? And what does it do well? And how does it do these things? This is just a completely new genre. But I think it is a genre, when I reflect upon it, that could be imported into academia. And you could imagine, uh, for instance, a scholarly society or a journal hosting a debate over a day or over a week between two scholars at the top of their game over a particular topic. I think that's a very live and interactive and, and sort of interesting form that won't be the static debates that we see in a print journal. So unexpected new genres. Um, there's another aspect of, of the unexpected web um, that I've spoken about before in other forums, and that's the unexpected use of the content that goes up on the web. The example I always like to use is from our September 11th digital archive, um, which we uh, did with the American Social History Project um, in New York. And um, here, you know, this was very rapidly built after 9-11. It ended up, uh, it's a website that collected memories, photographs, emails, audio, video. Um, it went up within three months of 9-11. We wanted to capture the born digital materials before they were lost. And to our surprise, it actually ended up collecting 150,000 digital objects from 30,000 people virtually every state, country in the world. And so it's a, a very large kind of raw digital archive. Um, in 2003, on the second anniversary of 9-11, we contributed it to the Library of Congress as a digital acquisition. Um, and you can see that the way we're thinking about this is um, the way historians think about how they go through physical archives, which is when we made the site, we made it browsable as you would sort of flip through the folios that you would get in a box that you've taken off the shelf in special collections that sort of one at a time we'd make our way through. But one of the unexpected uses that really woke me up to the potential of the web in 2002, 2003, when Roy and I were starting to think about our book on digital history, we looked at the logs, uh, the server logs of how people use the 9-11 collection. And what we couldn't believe is that there were actually uh, many linguists who had come through and were doing very extensive text mining and data mining of the collection. And then it struck us how much this made sense because we had a very open um, collection. There, was, there were no gates. You could come through and look at everything. Um, and so there were linguists who were very, very interested in the origins of modern teen slang. Um, texting, for instance. So we have one of the few archives that has a lot of ins early instances of OMG. Um, again, not something I could have anticipated ahead of time. Um, we have a lot of stories where um, cell phones were used, actually in about 25% of the stories. And again, this is relatively early in the use of cell phones. So, um, so we have sociologists who are looking at the use of cell phones on 9-11. Again, very different from the kinds of uses that we anticipated, but enabled by the open web. And I think the web is, is full of these kind of unanticipated uses. I think that that's part of the DNA of the web, is that once it's up there, people will make use of it in ways you can't anticipate. And I think we haven't leveraged that fact enough. So what, what I think has to go on is, you know, you ask yourself this question of how you handle surprises. And I think a lot of people on the open web have asked that same question, and they've come up with a solution of openness, modularity, and extensibility. You sort of admit, which is hard for academics to do, you admit that you don't have all the answers. This is really hard for someone with a PhD. Um, you, you have to say um, in some way that you're going to, to leave it half built. You're going to make something a tool or a collection or some kind of scholarly form that, um, again, like the burrito back bracket, might have to be iterated, might have to be changed along the way. Um, and so you think in these ways of openness, modularity, and extensibility. Um, and so, you know, one great example of this is WordPress, which at the center, we're really impressed with WordPress. Uh, I mean, in many ways. Uh, it runs a lot of our blogs, so we like it as our blogging software. But I think it's fascinating on many different levels. I think from a development standpoint, um, 
from the open source standpoint, I think it's a fascinating model and the way that they've engaged a very large uh, community of developers. They also have a very large community of users, 30 million blogs. Um, they have an interesting sustainability model, which I don't have time to get into today, um, but I might hint at later in, in the talk. Um, and they deal well with unexpected uses. Um, I also, just as a side note, a lot of people at, at the Center for History and New Media have picked up programming from WordPress. So they start using WordPress, and then it's a kind of gateway drug. Well, they want to tweak the CSS a little bit. They learn a little CSS. Then they start learning about WordPress functions. And they go under, they read the codex, the WordPress press codex, and they figure out how to kind of tweak the way their posts are shown or how many characters of each post are shown. And that kind of gets them into a little bit of that. Then they realize, oh, well, it's, that's not so different from PHP, and they learn PHP. And they, they go that way rather than some kind of formal training in computer science. They back their way into it. I think that's a fascinating model, actually, for engaging um, uh, non-technical um, scholars in, in development, in web development. So what WordPress does well is that it's, it's completely modular and it allows all kinds of modifications, unexpected uses, and it allows for the sharing of those modular uses. So here, of course, there are thousands of themes that people share freely um, through their WordPress gallery. So if you want to make your blog look different, you can install it right within WordPress, you can tweak it. Um, it's a really amazing collection of uh, WordPress themes. There are plugins, of course so that if you want to extend it, you can very easily do that. And they have very simple ways for all kinds of hooks and APIs and ways to modify the code. They have thousands of plugins for WordPress. So we've thought a lot about WordPress. We spent a lot of time looking very carefully, and I think Matt Mullenweg is a very smart guy, um, about the way that he set WordPress up from the start um, to take advantage of, of its webbiness. In our own projects, like Zotero and Omeka, um, we've really taken the model to heart, both from the back-end software development practices and also the way we model the functionality. If you look at our homepage today, there are these five tabs that show kind of the main kinds of functionality, but we really only started out with the first one. Um, the, the notion that we could collect from the web, the first insight of, of Zotero, the, the basic instance of it was just that we were doing research in the browser as historians, and so why should we have this tool kind of over there in some other desktop application? We should shoehorn the application into the web browser, Firefox, with its extensibility allowed us to do that, and then through some um, uh, magic, we were able to pick up information about scholarly objects on the web and identify those so that icons show up in the address bar and you can save this page not as a web page but as an article about ambivalence in the player's speech in Hamlet. So we started out here. We wanted to get past the cutting and pasting of bibliographic information. We found a way to do it. Um, we shamelessly cloned the iTunes interface and had it slide up from the bottom of the Firefox web browser. And we started there. But then um, only later did we then layer on social functionality, um, all kinds of new Web 2.0 elements, um, sharing, groups, these sorts of things that happen in 2.0. Um, we beefed up our documentation so that it, we made it a lot easier for people to extend the functionality of Zotero. We started to have a plugins um, shop uh, so that people could list their plugins. Um, and make them available to others simply from our homepage. Um, Tufts, with their view project, took advantage of this um, to add their kind of mind mapping and topical mapping system uh, and hook that up to um, uh, Zotero. Um, Caesar, the text mining platform, did the same thing. We have mapping tools and open layers. Map tool that plugs into Zotero and extracts uh, place names and text within Zotero and then maps it. Um, and I was delighted to hear about the advances in Simile and what's going to happen in Simile 2.0, but we've got their timeline tool shoehorned in here. Um, there's a plugin for audio and video annotation. All that happened, um, in a sense, with our knowledge, but um, because of the kind of modularity of the software. But beyond developers, we've also made um, a lot of choices to allow, I guess, regular users to extend and change Zotero. So one of the most basic, which I think a lot of projects um, forget about, is language localizations. That um, they don't start by um, 
uh, cutting out the English language strings in their software interface and putting those in a separate file. But the power of this is really remarkable, not just because you get crowdsourced translations of the interface, and I'm delighted to report that we have almost 50 of these, everything from Arabic to Vietnamese. We have Mongolian, uh, a Mongolian interface that's been written by the Mo Mongolian Academy of Sciences. Um, and we, in fact, we recently got a whole video introducing Zotero in Arabic um, that was sent to us. Um, but not only this, not only does it get this kind of pragmatic language localizations, but it, it gets people involved. The people who maintain these language localizations are really invested in the project. They take pride in if we add a new menu element, it's very instantly translated via the Babelzilla website. Um, they get involved in the project. They feel like in some ways they are developers of the project as well. People can create citation styles. So we adopted an open XML format called CSL, Citation Style Language, and um, journals or individuals can write CSLs uh, to format your bibliography from Zotero in a very specific format. Um, we have over a thousand of these that people have contributed, um, shared back and forth. Um, if you understand XML, it's relatively easy to write one of these. Um, again, so there's a, a low hurdle to get over to become involved with development on the project. We have um, a way to create site translators, which is our nickname for making a site Zotero compatible. So when someone who's surfing around the web with Zotero comes to a site and wants to extract archival material or scholarly objects, um, those little icons show up. It uses JavaScript and XML. And we have, um, at this point, over 350 people with commit level access, who've, many of whom are contributing these translators. So every night new ones come in, they get shipped out to everyone in the Zotero community, and more and more of those icons show up as you surf around the web. So think about all the different ways that people can get involved here from, from very technically unsophisticated, just giving us you know, what's the French word for that menu item, all the way up to core co commits to the code. Um, in addition, we've encouraged interoperability by adopting standards. So um, in this case, you've got WorldCat has a feature called Lists, where you can um, create your own bibliographies online on the WordPress site by getting an account. And they adopted a standard that we used in Zotero, um, which means we didn't even have to create a translator. You just surf over to a work WorldCat list, and the folder icon shows up, and you can grab and import references from WorldCat. So we end up with a kind of virtuous circle here of semantic information. I also don't want to belittle this, although it's kind of amusing, but we get translators on very non-academic sites, um, sites outside the ivory tower. So um, Epicurious, there is, a, there is a Zotero translator for Epicurious um, that allows you to grab recipes using Zotero. You can use Zotero entirely as a recipe management system. Um, and it actually dumps the ingredients into a Dublin Core metadata field. Um, you can print out a shopping list and go make these delicious uh, Christmas cookies here. Um, so why is this important? Again, I think it strengthens um, the, the development of the project. I think having this many stakeholders, the fact that there's a recipe community using Zotero, which I think, you know, maybe in, again, the other psychological mode that's common in academia, you'd say, well, you know, we're, we want to do highbrow stuff. We don't want to do this. But I think in this case, it, it strengthens the project that there are people out there thinking about writing translators for sites like Epicurious. And we have swag. <laughs> this is Christmas 2010 doorbuster available on our Zotero store. Um, nice um, jacket, great. If you're going through the airport, you can wear your colors. Um, Okay, Omeka, just very briefly again, adopts the WordPress model even more specifically. It's a platform for collections, an open source content management system. And again, here we've thought about theming. So we use Omeka in-house for projects like our history of the Soviet Gulag or um, our history of the, the uh, Mexican guest worker program uh, after World War II. Um, Many other institutions use it to host uh, exhibits and digital collections. Um, and all of these themes are shareable. They're all done in a way that's completely modular. We have set up from the beginning, Omeka has a site where you can get involved. Again, multiple levels. You can do documentation, you can do development, you can do design work like themes. We have a plugin gallery. I think we've got 20 or 25 plugins now 
for uh, Omeka, everything from very geeky stuff like OAI PMH to things that are oriented toward pedagogy, like the ability to set up um, student archives or, or um, uh, student accounts on, on a website. Again, we have themes um, that are easily shared. Um, and like WordPress, and I was talking about that elusive sustainability model, we've recently launched Omeka.net, which like WordPress.com takes an open source package and provides hosting services for institutions and individuals that don't want to go through the hassle of installing an open source package and running it themselves or to run a server. So we do that for them at Omeka.net as opposed to Omeka.org where you get the software for free. So let me move now from um, platforms for research and digital collections to the scholarship that can be done on the web. What can we learn here from vernacular forms? Um, you know, we're still, 20 years in the web, we're still mostly writing articles and books. And so I think that this is one area that a lot more work needs to be done in. Um, you know, can blogs be scholarship? Can Twitter be a, a process of peer review? That is an open question, but I think it's worth asking. Um, you know, I, I was sort of depressed by this um, survey that the Association of American University Publishers did last winter, where they asked their membership, you know, what their digital strategies were. And I'm sure the questions were formulated this way, but they were almost all about books. So the AAUP members, and you can see the top answers, and I'm sorry, it's fairly small here, but they're all about, you know, print on demand, ebooks, ebook sales. Um, um, open access to books, right? Books, 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 ebook collections. And then, much like the asterisk next to um, Roger Maris's 61st home run, down here at the bottom where I have this little red arrow, it says, oh, you know, a couple of us were also maybe thinking about blogs, you know? And I think it's worth asking, you know, what business we're in. And I think university presses should be in the scholarly communication business, right? I think that they should be expansive in their thinking about digital publishing. Um, and um, so I think this is one area that, again, begs the question of are we going to do it the academic way or are we going to think about importing or making better use of vernacular forms? Meanwhile, there are blogs proliferating, um, becoming increasingly prevalent in academic writing. Um, actually, blogs, I think, have become more erudite on average because students recently abandoned blogs for social networks, which is great. You know, leave it, leave it to the professoriate. Um, uh, you know, there are wonderful blogs. I don't have enough time here to, to go over the great academic blogs I subscribe to. Um, here's one by Professor of Architecture Jeff Manal. Uh, some of you might read Building Blog. Um, really takes advantage of the web, has a huge audience. It's probably the best architecture blog on the web and maybe some of the best architectural writing anywhere. Um, and this post that, that I've uh, taken a screen capture here is a meditation on the ways in which careful reading of zoning laws, um, zoning regulations, actually allows some creative architects to make structures that, um, in a sense, um, you know, one wouldn't expect. Um, here there was, they, they found a loophole which allowed them to get more square footage by cantilevering the buildings out over the road. Um, and I think in some sense it's a nice metaphor for what Jeff's been doing for many years um, on, as a scholar on his blog. He just, he doesn't need the permission of anyone, of a journal, to do what he's doing. He just creates good content and, and from that he's developed a very large audience of architects, architectural historians, and scholars interested in architecture. Um, there are terrific group blogs, Frog in a Well, the collaborative um, web blog dedicated to East Asian history, um, is a very good site. Um, I, I, this is not an area of my specialty, but I'm a subscriber to the blog because I think there's very interesting work being done on this blog, um, reviews of literature, but also original pieces and comments on contemporary events from the perspective of Asian historians. Many of you probably know Crooked Timber, site for intellectual discourse, a lot here also on history uh, and history writing. It's got some of the best writers um, on the web and, they've, and it's very highbrow stuff. 
Um, and law, of course, is a very big, the LC has an archive of law blogs, I think it's actually blogs, um, if I can get that word correct, B-L-A-W-G-S. Um, the Volokh Conspiracy is the biggest law blog in the United States. Um, it's mostly law professors, um, and uh, it has a lot of readers. In fact, I took a screen, a screen capture of Quantcast yesterday, it's got 137,000 average visitors a month um, worldwide. Uh, so, you know, that's a bigger, much bigger audience, by the way, than law journals. Probably it's a bigger audience than all law journals combined. Um, and you start looking at these numbers and you start thinking, you know, if you're Eugene um, Volokh, you know, where would you want to publish your work, right? What, what is the point of your scholarly work? Um, do you want to publish it to a very small audience that might leaf buy it in a paper journal, or do you want something with 137,000 readers in multiple disciplines? So I think you know blogs are con continue to be disparaged um, for being shorter form than the you know average 8,000 word article, but um, and surely there are cases where longer forms are necessary. But blogs have the advantage of the web way and the open way where the unexpected can happen. Let me give a quick example of that from my own work on my blog. Um, you know, I wrote this post over the summer on open access publishing and scholarly values, and um, it talked about a lot of what I've, I've just spoken about here and, and the importance of openness from a kind of ethical standpoint. Um, but a curious thing happened as this post went out. Um, Steve Ramsey, um, a lit professor at Nebraska wrote a very long response in which he called it part two of my response. Kathleen Fitzpatrick, a media studies scholar, then wrote part three of this article that I wasn't expecting to have more than part one. And then Richard um, Lavin, who I've never met, um, wrote a very long piece on all of our pieces which he put up on his blog with the comment, comment press plugin so that other people could comment on his comments. Um, it went on and on. Um, here's Paul Fife's um, uh, piece and um, another long, you know, 1,000, 2,000 word blog post. Um, in addition, on all of these blog posts, there were 60 comments, many of which were very long. Um, now, to me, that looks a lot like scholarship, right? I mean, you can disparage it as blogs, but it looks a lot like scholarship. It is open debate. It is, um, it's not the static, heavily footnoted scholarship of the academic journal, but it should be recognizable to intellectuals in any age as scholarship and as the open discussion and debate that scholars do. Um, so, you know, I don't buy the critique that blogs are vanity publishing at this point. I think there's a lot going on in the blogosphere that um, more fields in academia beyond digital humanities, where there's been a very active blogosphere for a long time, um, I think this could, could happen in, in much uh, greater ways. Um, you know, obviously at this point, the critique is, well, you know, how about real peer review, blind peer review? And we could get into debate, which I don't have time for right now, about post-peer review versus pre-peer review and blind versus open. But clearly the openness of the forum allows all comers to, to sort of weigh in. And it requires the author. I had to respond to comments on my blog and to these other comments on other blogs in this decentralized fashion in a, in a way that's much more uh, uh, labor intensive than a regular peer review uh, process. Um, I'd also note here that I'm a historian. If I had published something like this, let's say I published it in the Journal of American History, I would have heard from historians. But you note here I heard from a literature professor and a media studies person. I don't even know who those last two people were. But I can tell you that this is a much more interdisciplinary way of producing scholarship. And it, it brings me into um, discussions with people I never thought I would have discussions with. And I think that is also extremely healthy. Um, from the, the point of view of scholarship. Also on the question of um, peer review, I mean, if you look at academic publishing, reviews in American history, um, you know, there's no way to respond. The web way of review is recursive. I think it's really critical to note that the web involves recursive review. 
So you can have reviews of the original object and then reviews of the reviews, um, right? And this can go on and on. Um, if you look at the history of peer review on the web, which um, in many ways begins with Slashdot, the tech um, discussion site's pioneering commenting system, which voted up and down comments, and in some sense separated the wheat from the chaff. It's nothing like the stereotypical view of uh, comments on the web from within um, academia where people say, oh, well, it's just the riffraff and it's a free for all. It doesn't have to be that way. There are very sophisticated uh, recursive peer review systems on the web that we could experiment with. I also think just the openness of it, the fact that your scholarship's on the web is a sort of check against error. Um, you know, the example I like to use recently is this blog by Ken Levine, who is a, um, a writer in Hollywood. And he's got a blog on TV, um, uh, but he took a diversion to make a criticism and actually some people weighed in about um, the social network, um, the movie The Social Network this fall. Open, out there on the web, easily found via Google and news readers and, and those sorts of things. So, you know, what happened? Aaron Sorkin wrote a long response. Actually, the most uh, critical response that Sorkin has written. Um, more than anything, he's written to, um, you know, the New York Review of Books or the New Yorker's review of his movie. He went on this blog and took apart these criticisms of his movie and said, you know, here's what I was trying to do. So, you know, I think about, let's say, book reviews in history, um, you know, you open those up, the, the author can come back and say, you know, here's why you, the reviewer, is wrong. Or others can come in and say, hey, this is just a bunch of log rolling by a friend of this author. Because it's in inert form in the print journal, it just doesn't have this capacity that the web has to be recursive. I think that's accountability. I actually, just a, a side story here, I once wrote something that um, was si slightly inaccurate about Vint Cerf. Um, you probably know, one of the fathers of the internet and now at Goog uh, the chief um, internet evangelist at Google. I wrote it that morning. By that afternoon, I had an email from Vint asking for a correction on my blog, which I then did. Um, but, you know, clearly he's out there and um, uh, again, um, you have to get things right. I don't think it is just a free-for-all of writing. But comments in the blogs, I think, are only the beginning of more sophisticated systems separating the good from the bad. Um, and I think there's ways that the web can actually make it easier, just as a journal does today and in the past, to read a manageable number of works in one's field. I think this is another common and still long-lasting criticism of the web is, oh my gosh, there's just so much out there. There's so many blogs. You know, at least the journal, I get it every quarter in my field, and I only have to read those things. Let's forget it. I'm, uh, forget about how myopic that is, but, but still, I think um, there are systems out there on the web, and this is what I'm currently tracking on, just as a final point for this talk, of the ways in which the web is now trying out genres to aggregate and curate, to separate the good from the bad, and to show the power of centralized attention when placed on top of a system that allows for decentralized publishing. This actually happened early on. If you look at the history of blogging, very early on when blogs started to grow exponentially, you started seeing a genre emerge called the carnival, where um, individual bloggers would host a carnival where they would point to what they thought were the best blog posts from the past month or quarter in their field. Um, here's just a recent one, the history carnival that is now doing this. Um, same idea, they might pick out 10 or 15 blog posts, say why they thought they were good. In a sense, again, aggregation and curation on a personal format. Um, out there in the tech press, this has become much more sophisticated. So um, a, a great example is TechMeme, um, which some of you may read, but um, TechMeme aggregates all of the tech news during the day and distills it down to the eight or 10 stories you really need to know for that day. So if you can't read the thousand and one tech blogs on your topic. You could go to TechMeme, pick, uh, pick out a specific area or just look at the general feed and you'll get just sort of at a glance what you need to know, right? This is aggregation and curation in action. It's also, TechMeme is much more complex than it seems at first sight. When the creators uh, made TechMeme, it was at first initially 100% algorithmic. 
So it would look at links from blogs and tweets and just pick the greatest aggregate from that to put on the homepage. Now actually they've measured in some human um, editorial uh, latitude into the site to be able to surface uh, websites that might not be the big websites in technology. So they will try to point to, for instance, an individual blog that people haven't heard about as much as they will to a big site like from Apple or Google. Um, TechMeme has spawned all kinds of clones like Twitter Times and Paperly, um, which create a TechMeme-like site based on links mentioned by people you follow on Twitter. Um, and people are now using these sites, and in fact there are applications, apps for the, um, for the iPad like uh, Flipboard that do the same thing as these websites that again dil distill down what people are talking about in your social circle to the few things you need to know so that you can check in just once a day and read those articles. Really fascinated by the recent launch a couple of weeks ago of Food Press, um, which besides making me salivate, um, is, um, is an aggregator for food blogs from WordPress.com. And um, so again, it's taking, there's a lot of food bloggers, and it surfaces the best recipes, the best stories in, out of the 30 million WordPress.com blogs and indeed goes on to curate them into various things, like if you're just interested in vegetarian food, you can subscribe to a curated feed of vegetarian recipes or stories from the blogosphere. They also have a breakout box highlighting specific authors that they think are good. So again, it surfaces quality work um, in the world, WordPress um, world. So okay, this is about food, I understand that. But what I'm saying is again, if we just think about the vernacular web, I think this is really fascinating to think about, you know, importing this model. If you are a historical society and every um, scholar in your society had a blog, right, and you hosted a centralized site that aggregated attention that people could come to to read the best from the membership, that strikes me as a very powerful value added process. There are sites that do this. Um, there's, of course, the venerable Arts and Letters Daily, which has been doing this for over a decade. More recently in the UK, there's this terrific site, The Browser, which pulls up sites, um, uh, excuse me, stories from across the web that um, uh, are often you know, academic in nature. Um, so I think there's a lot we can learn from these sites that, again, distill down the web into a manageable number of articles or things to read or pointers to projects that you might want to look at. Um, people are starting to figure this out. And I think it's starting, as usual, in the sciences. There's been a proliferation in the past few years of science blogs, um, multi-user blogs like science blogs that, again, host a kind of multi-user installation of blogging software, but then aggregates into a surface on the homepage, the best of science blogging from that day or week. Um, there are some pioneering universities like the University of Mary Washington and um, CUNY that have created um, WordPress MU websites that aggregate scholarship and work from across their universities and bring it together um, onto a single page or a customized feed. I think these are very powerful models. Um, just a little plug for one of my little side projects here, but um, for the past year I've been doing a, a, I guess a quote unquote journal called Digital Humanities Now that aggregates um, what digital humanities scholars are looking at across the web and tries to surface again the most important stories. Um, I've recently revamped this site and uh, to point to more substantial work by the quote unquote members of the digital humanities community um, while also allowing, if you scroll down to the bottom of the site, if you're looking at it live, just the raw stream of what digital humanities scholars are looking at, a lot of which is stuff from across the vernacular web, um, but uh, uh, it gives a good sense of what at least this scholarly community is looking at. So I think there are models here that can, again, be emulated. I think this model here could be emulated in many fields, um, even ones that don't have an extensive blogosphere like digital humanities does. I think Twitter is also a really interesting example of aggregation and curation. Um, there, are, there are scholars like Jay Rosen, the journalism professor at NYU, who has, let's see, he's approaching 50,000 followers on Twitter. 
Um, I think pr pretty much every journalist, journal uh, student of journalism, um, professional journalists uh, subscribe to his, his Twitter feed. And um, he uses it rather bluntly as a platform for taste ma making and vetting. He calls people out, he points to good substantial work in new media and journalism. Um, he understands the web with uh, Dave Weiner, um, often called the father of RSS. Um, he has this website where he aggregates the links that he's pointed to and then notes how many people actually click through on those links. You can just go to this page. If, if his Twitter stream is too much for you, then you can just go to this page and see you know, the 40 most recent links and sort of what he has to say about that, how he's curating those links across the web and how many people click through them so you can get a sense of what the community thought was important as well. I've done some stunt uses of Twitter from a scholarly perspective. Um, Cliff knows that uh, a year ago I was up in New York um, at the Digital Dilemmas Symposium and um, I, I just posted this image from the Victorian age um, from 1882, an image of a, um, a an object that was found in St. Clair County, Illinois by a young anthropologist from the Smithsonian. And um, I sort of replicated how you might be able to use Twitter to do what this guy did, which is he brought this back from Illinois and asked in a salon the, the other anthropologist, you know, well, what is this? How can I figure out what this is? So I posted this object on Twitter. Um, we used a hashtag to aggregate the comments about what the object was. And I challenged the audience out there beyond the talk to try to figure out what this thing was. Um, you know, I'm lucky to have a lot of Twitter followers, so perhaps this wouldn't, wouldn't work for everybody, but I could see it working if a scholarly society had aggregated their membership uh, on Twitter. Um, and so I gave everyone an hour to figure out what it was. Um, in that very web way, there were scholars in many different fields, religious studies, anthropology, um, information sciences, um, all kind of took stabs at it, started talking to each other, adding each other back and forth, and um, it took 29 minutes for them to come up with a fairly rich description that this was an ornamental uh, gorget from the Co uh, Cahokia tribe. Um, it's made out of shell. It has two uh, holes in the top because it was used as a necklace. Um, and um, again, unlike the sort of siloed, inert discussions in the scholarly journal, this sort of showed what the live web can do. And I don't think the creators of Twitter ever anticipated that you know, it would be used in this way. But it is, again, the unanticipated uses, the permissionless innovation that can happen on the web that enables these kinds of uses. Now, people who know me know that I'm, I'm really a pragmatist about these things. And I don't pretend that we're going to move on to Twitter and blogs in 2011, although that would be nice. Um, but um, you know, there is a lot of inherently conservative aspects of the academy. And perhaps that's good. right? It is the storehouse of knowledge and the advancement of knowledge. Um, and we're raised as scholars with really acute attention to what economists would call signals of quality. The book has many signals of quality to it. Um, I think those signals of quality, and if you look at what's going on in journalism right now and how journalism is changing, it's because the signals of quality associated with the newspaper is eroding. Jay Rosen talks a lot about that on his Twitter feed and on his blog. Um, you know, obviously, there are things like the iPad and the, the surprisingly rapid adoption of e-readers that's kind of eating away at some of the, these signals, the signals of the physical book, that the physical book is, is worthy of reading and something else is not worthy of reading. What happens when we start reading everything on an e-reader? The sort of behavioral aspects of reading, I think, are changing. I think apps like Instapaper, my favorite iPad app, um, by a 28-year-old developer, Marco Arment, um, who also, I think, is an intellectual. I think this is an app that makes an argument about reading, excuse me, um, makes an argument about reading in that it takes any text, a blog post, a newspaper article, an academic article, and it formats them in exactly the same way and gives you a nice little journal to read in the evening. So it's already eroding those signals of quality and saying to you, hey, here's just writing. It's writing. Read it in the same way. You can flip through it um, as, uh, as you would any beautifully formatted work. 
The NEH funded a one week, one tool crash course charrette at George Mason University this summer to create a digital humanities tool. Um, I can take no credit for this whatsoever, but they came up with this tool called Anthologize, which is a WordPress plugin, which takes WordPress content either aggregated from around the web or within a specific WordPress installation, uh, orders it, formats it, spits it out into a variety of formats, including EPUB, which you can then pop onto your iPad. It looks as good as a book. Um, they did that in one week. It's rather impressive. It's now being updated. Um, but you can imagine projects like this and like Instapaper forcing us to reconsider cues for quality, the, f the form of writing itself without the fancy trappings that come with the journal or the book. I always like to bring up the unpretentious wine writer Alexis Lachine's um, shrewd comment about um, deciding whether wine is good or bad. Um, you know, he said there's no substitute for pulling corks, right? He, just, he would constantly meet people who would say, oh, it's just, you know, it's beautiful first growth from, you know, and he'd say, no, just open it up, drink it. Do you like it? Is it good? You have to open the bottle to understand whether it's good. So I think there will be a process that occurs over the next decade that erodes traditional signals of quality and makes us more expansively interested in all kinds of writing and all kinds of genres and new modes of work that happens across the web. So, burrito bracket, did anyone figure it out? Yes, Nate Silver um, was the creator of the burrito bracket. Um, before this point, he was best known as a baseball statistician. And um, he sort of grew sick of burritos. And so in 2008, he shut down the burrito bracket site and set up another blog called 538.com, which he used to begin to analyze the horse race between Obama and McCain and what was going on in the 2008 election in general. Um, you know, can a burrito statistician uh, you know, brazenly decide to analyze elections and the economy uh, better than most newspapers? On the web, yes, on the open web, he can. Um, and, you know, I became a huge fan, as many did, of, of Nate Silver's work. I mean, it was just high quality writing and you could compare it um, to what was going on in the New York Times, say, at that, at that point. And it was just as good, if not better. Now, you might know where this all ended up. New York Times bought 538.com this year. They recognized quality. Yes, it came from this burrito bracket guy who brazenly set this site up, but they realized good is good, right? Writing is writing. He set out, he created his own blog, he didn't publish in a journal, he didn't go through any vetting systems, but they understood that good is good, and they've now aggregated this up, they've pulled it up, the chain of value onto the New York Times site itself. He is now effectively a Times columnist. And that's how the web scrambles signals. Um, and I think that is an incredible important lesson from the first 20 years of the web, and something that we need to think more about in the academy still. The web is a place, it's a, it's a wondrous place. I think still, after 20 years, it has permissionless innovation, it has a spirit of do it yourself, um, it's interdisciplinary, it allows for community and collaboration in a way that inert academic forms don't. And so 20 years into the age of the web, I think we still have much more work to do on incorporating this open web's potential into the ivory tower. Thank you very much. So before I give the traffic report on I-95 North and South, um, I've been told there's time for a few questions if anyone has, has them. Right, that's a, that's a, the question is about um, the advantages, I think, of current publishing, um, per, current academic environment where an editor can receive articles from anyone and so uh, is sort of forced to see potential good new work that's out there. And the response I have on that is um, uh, just a quick example. Um, uh, I have various Google alerts for topics like digital humanities and digital history, and um, I always am on the lookout for good new scholars um, on the web. And uh, recently I, I, I found through this, this method, this uh, graduate student at Princeton who's working on a, a digital history of the 19th century and working on text mining. And I think he's years away from publishing 
anything in the field. He's still early in his academic career. But because he set up a blog um, and I could find pointers to that blog, I was able to find him and start collaborating with him. We started trading back graphs of, of keywords in the 19th century and these sorts of things in a way that in some ways is a, a flip side of what you just mentioned. So I, per, I, I completely agree and I think there are ways to probably slot in still submissions on something like let's say Digital Humanities Now where you could have a form that would submit articles into that. But also to find out through these kind of tendrils of the social networks and the blogosphere to find new work it, sort of where it is, right? Um, it also allows for new forms. You know, he's doing work that probably won't show up well in a print, you know, 8,000 word article. He's got graphs, he's got um, text mining work to do. And so in some ways, I think we can have our cake and eat it too. I think we can continue to have a kind of submission process, but also match that up with some of what the web does well. Yes, Mark? There's a saying that science advances most quickly through the death of old scientists, um, which is sort of a preface to um, what about promotion and tenure, and until promotion and tenure in academia can recognize new media, what's the rewards? Right. Um, this is a question that comes up frequently and is, is much discussed. Um, I, uh, this is where I think that there needs to be a combination of efforts between um, institutions like university presses, uh, scholarly societies, and scholars themselves, and people working on infrastructure. Um, I think there are ways still to validate this material, but I do not doubt that for a long time, right, the inertia of things, like for instance the book in my field, is very tough to get over, right? I mean, think about how much would have to change uh, in history. Um, with respect to different forms of publication. I mean, people still getting PhDs, they effectively are writing a proto book called a dissertation. Then they graduate, then they have to turn that book into something publishable to get tenure, and then they have to write another book for a full professorship. There's just a gamesmanship there. I mean, it's, a, it's just a vertically integrated industry here of bookmaking. And so it's very hard. That's a lot of inertia in the system for those sorts of things. So. Uh, you know, I think in the pragmatist way, what I would say is it's just, it's going to be hard to swap these things out. It's going to be hard to swap out the blog for the book. But I think a good place to start is to expand the footprint of scholarly communication to say you can do the book, but you might also want to have a blog about your process of the book or some things that didn't make its way into the book or some other thoughts you're having on a new project and to begin to have those things aggregated in a way that once the attention is aggregated on those formats, you can begin to get validity and signals of quality that would count in the promotion and tenure process. So my game plan, for instance, for Digital Humanities Now is, okay, right now it's pulling all these things together, but I want to get an editorial board on it. I want to have a best of Digital Humanities Now for 2010 that gets the best of the best, the best of the things that made the homepage, which happened generally algorithmically. But you could have people then stretch out, right? So now we're, we're moving up the scholarly communications pyramid to just the very top 1%, let's say, of all work that's new projects that were launched that were cited on, on Digital Humanities Now, great blog posts or new tools that have been submitted that could go into some format where we could say, this is an item that could go on your CV. This has been vetted even to a higher level. And so I think there are ways to, again, iterate toward validation in that way. Okay, uh, wait, looks like one more question, I think. So you mentioned the uh, vernacular web several times. Uh, j just wondering what the non-vernacular web is. Um, what the, I'm sorry, what the? What the non-vernacular web is. Um, well, I, again, I think it is, um, I'm using it really as a shorthand for, um, uh, let's say, Google Maps versus GIS, right? I think there's a lot that scholars can do with Google Maps faster, and in many cases, just as well as they could with extensive training in, in GIS. I mean, if you look at that Nate Silver 
blog, um, he's making use of these technologies that are just kind of out there that you don't need substantial scholarly training to understand and use. So, um, you know, perhaps it's not a great word, and that's why I've substituted open web in here, the web beyond the academy. You can choose your favorite um, modifier. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. That was an that was an incredibly rich talk, and I suspect that uh, I know I'm going to be digesting that for some time to come. Um, it it just for me connected off in so many different directions peer review, engagement with the public, um, uh, dealing with overwhelming information flows, uh, crossing disciplinary boundaries. Um, I think there's, there's just a tremendous amount in there and I'm very happy to say that um, we've got video of this that we'll make available um, probably early in the new year on the web um, and uh, that we'll have an opportunity through that to uh, revisit some of these ideas that Dan has shared with us. Um, Dan, thank you for an incredible conclusion to our fall meeting. I, the, tremendous, thanks. And with that, let me wish you safe travels, happy holidays, and I will see you all in the new year. Thanks again. <laughs>